Uh, I want to welcome everybody to this blab. We've got a, a bunch of people signed up, probably the most that I've seen uh, for one of my blabs. Wow. And um, yeah, and of course, we'll get a lot of replays. Hey, Eugen, Eugen probably calling in from Thailand. So wow. excellent. Okay, wow. so uh, he's, he's usually in Romania. But, uh, but anyway, um, so uh, my guest today is Anthony Gailey. And I just want to tell you just per a little personal thing about how I found out about this man because it was it was really crazy. Um, my uh, my friend uh, Kenda Summers and I were doing a show in Iowa, a couple of shows in Iowa, and we were we were trying out some new routines uh, that we were going to use at a hypnosis convention show that we were going to do. And a young hypnotist came in there. His name is uh, Corey Osborne. And uh, Corey has since become a really good friend. Anyway, Corey came to our show, and uh, Corey is now a successful stage hypnotist. And Corey and I talked about the type of shows that hypnotists do. And I mentioned that I love to do high school shows and, and college shows because they're just so much fun. And we talked about corporate shows. And I said, I don't like them. I said, they pay better than any other show, but I don't like them. Why? Corey asked. And I said, because bad things can happen. You can show up at the show and nobody has told them there's going to be a hypnotist there. And you get lots of people looking at you like this. Oh, mm -hmm. no. And saying, saying encouraging things like, good luck getting volunteers because I'm not getting up on that stage. So this is the sort of thing that you're greeted with when you do a corporate show. Uh, and, and people don't want to embarrass themselves in front of the bosses. The bosses don't embarrass themselves in front of the employees. It's, it's a mess. And I said, corporate, yuck. And Corey said to me, well, have you ever heard of Anthony Gailey? And I said, uh, I, I'm not sure. It sounds familiar. But he said, Anthony Gailey, you've got to look him up on YouTube. He said, you're going to find something amazing. So that night... I looked you up on YouTube and I watched it. And my first thought was, this guy has cracked the code. I, I went from hating corporate shows to thinking, this, this is very cool. So I watched this man operate uh, on YouTube with a corporate crowd in front of their peers, in front of their bosses, in front of their uh, direct reports. And it was, it was classy, it was fun. And as it was a corporate event, we all know corporate events pay far better than going to high schools and colleges and, and, and fairs and, and, and cruises and everything else. It's the best paying work out there. But as I say, I thought this man has cracked the code as far as how to make corporate really a, a viable option for a hypnotist. So um, I'd, I'd like to welcome Anthony Gailey to this, this blab here. By the way, if you all have questions... Um, if you want to ask a question, you want it to stand out, put a forward slash and a Q and then type your question and it'll it'll appear in a special box here so we can see it. Uh, and the other thing is on the left hand side of your screen, you might see something that says tell a little bird or uh, Facebook. I know Kenda's already tweeted this, but if you would please click on that and let people know what you're listening to. I know a lot of hypnotists would get a lot out of this talk. So uh, welcome, Anthony Gailey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And you're in <laughs> Germany, right? I am I am in Germany. Uh, the wonders yes. of technology never ceases to fascinate yes. me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I guess <clears throat> I guess we have to start out with the the question that everybody always asks, which is how did you get start in hypno started in hypnosis? Everybody asks. <laughs> um, truth is, I saw a television program, uh, black and white, no color TV, when I was nine years old. And it had a spiel about hypnosis in it as part of the plot of this sitcom. And I just was mm -hmm. like, what is that? And then um, went to my local library. I lived in a small town. And the only information I could find was in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, the only reference to it at all. And uh, I actually started buying stuff off the backs of comic books. No, 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 <laughs> not kidding. And one book I got was rather a good book. It was, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, Melvin Powers, and it was called Advanced. Yes, Technique. of course. And the guy was actually a well-written book, unbelievably so, you know? So it gave me some real information and some you know, actually truth. 
and I ran around hypnotizing kids in the neighborhood for a while until <laughs> they stopped me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just got fascinated with it from a very early age. And uh, uh -huh. as soon as I got my driver's license, I drove two towns over to a guy that was teaching courses. I have no idea if he ever you know, made a name for himself, but his name was Frank Lodato in Pensacola, New Jersey. And then I went to Rutgers and there was a gentleman there named Max Rapkin who was a hypnotherapist and he had, uh, they would supplement their income by doing these uh, eight or nine week long, you know, how to, how to become a hypnotherapist training courses. And that was the huh? second course I took. And just uh, with serendipity, I got noticed by one of my college professors. Uh, it, was, it was in those days, you could become what was called a casual worker for uh, loading and unloading freight docks. Uh, I lived mm -hmm. at Rutgers University, which is where I went, was fairly close to Edison, New Jersey, which is right outside of New York. And they had this just enormous uh, freight depot, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trucks that fed New York. And they would sometimes hire college kids at $30 an hour, which in those days was just... Whoa, yeah. big money, yeah. yeah. And, and, <laughs> but the shift was from midnight till nine in the morning. And they worked the living daylights out of you. You were doing nothing but moving freight for eight solid hours. And you just, right. you come out of there, you were covered from head to toe with the grit and the grime of the loading dock. And, uh -huh. and well, on some of those occasions, I'd have to race off the class. I mean, I'd get out at nine and my class would start at 9.30 or whatever. So I'd go straight from work. And um, I was hypnotizing people at Rutgers, uh, fraternities and dorm parties and things of that nature. And I'm sitting in this class uh -huh. and, and at Rutgers, some of the, you know, intro psych classes, the year one and year two psych classes have two, 300 people in them, you know, those big amphitheaters. Yeah. And so I'm sitting in the amphitheater and somebody raised their hand and asked the question and said, you know, I saw this hypnotist at this fraternity last week, do this <laughs> thing where, you know, and it just looks impossible. And what do you think? And the professor answered it and gave what I thought was a wrong answer. And I, I, it just <laughs> yeah. was a wrong answer. And so I raised my hand, you know, and he said, what? And I stood up and I said, well, I was the guy that did that. And I'm dressed, you know, in my <laughs> steel tip boots and covered in grime. Yeah. Area. And so afterwards, he, he was he was genuinely interested and he asked me, uh -huh. um, you know, what books I had and what I knew. And so I shared with him some of my books and he was kind enough to connect me with, with a professor that was doing active research in hypnosis at that time. His mm -hmm. name was Dr. Mm -hmm. John Santa and I became his research assistant for, oh, I guess, good. the last three years of my college experience. And he was kind enough to turn me on um, to, to uh, the professor down at the Florida Atlantic University when I went down to do my master's degree. So I was fortunate enough to be connected with some uh, very fluent people in the science or, or of hypnosis. Right. And um, right after, as I was finishing my graduate program, one of the people that was in my graduate program, there were only eight of us. Yeah, when you go to a graduate level, it's not 100 people. It's usually five or six or seven graduate students. Uh -huh. I think there were eight in of your us. cohort, yeah. And one of the gentlemen was about 10 years older than I was, and he had actually had a hypnosis practice that he had built in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Yep. And he was, going, uh -huh. he was going off to Tennessee. I was staying in the uh, South Florida area, and he offered to sell me his practice, and then he taught me how to run it. So that's what got me into hypnotherapy, actual, actually being a hypnotherapist. Yeah, right. And I did that for a few years and then sold it. And then I moved to Hawaii and I ended up moving in a very, very remote part of the Hawaiian Islands. I don't know how familiar you are, uh -huh. but I was on the East Rift of the Big Island. I was about 25 uh -huh. miles away from the caldera, Halima'uma'u, <laughs> the world's most active volcano. I was about 20 miles away from that. You know, so we'd see and feel hear that nonsense, you know? The earth would shake. Do, do you lose a bet? What, what, what? No, actually, if you can imagine the Garden of Paradise, if, uh, I don't know, you know, the thing like you read in the book, Adam and Eve ran through it. If you have an image of what that's like, lush, gorgeous, uh -huh. palm trees, plumerias, passion fruit, fruit you just grab off the tree, coconut, I mean, wow. that's <laughs> where I lived, was as close uh -huh. on earth as any place I've ever seen that looked exactly like paradise. Un un wow. Unfortunately, it had no electricity, no public water, no telephones. <laughs> you know, it was beautiful, but it was pretty remote. And uh -huh. um, there just weren't enough people to continue the private practice. And that's that's when I got into the public speaking. So <clears throat> that's how it started. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So so um, before you got into the public speaking, were you doing regular hypnosis shows as well? Schools and, and 
Yes and no. That the only real shows that I did, I, in terms of actual, you know, quote unquote, stage hypnosis, was was through college. In my in my freshman year in college, I went. There was a guy there. I won't say name because somebody might. But anyhow, he was doing fraternities and stuff, and I went to see him. Do it. Uh -huh. time I said, "This guy sucks. <laughs> this guy is not." Like that. <laughs> I just thought it was really not that good, and I felt like I mm -hmm. could do better than that. So I put something uh -huh. together and I started doing it. And um, like I said, for dorms and fraternities. And uh, right. one day, one of the biggest fraternities on campus called and they were having a party. Someone heard about me. What do I charge? And it was $50. I said, you know, it'd be $50 for me to go in and do my thing. And they called back a couple of days later and said that uh, they decided not to use me. They were using this other guy. And I said, why? Well, because he charges $300. And, you know, the brothers sat around and just. <laughs> You know, six times better than you are, and my price the next day went up to three hundred dollars, and I was, I was doing <laughs> quite well. I really, I was making you know for those days what was a fair amount of money, and about six months later it was time to buy books and you know, the semester and all that jazz. And I remember calling my parents saying, "You don't have to send me any money for books or whatever." And my father said, "Are you doing drugs? Are you selling drugs?" You know, just like, <laughs> <laughs> "No, I'm doing these hypnosis shows." Well, what's you know what? <laughs> <laughs> the heck is that? Well, why don't you come and see it? And and they did. My mom and dad, you know, much to their credit, the next time I had a thing, they both came up and they both saw it. And my, they were just, they were just, they didn't understand it, but they were, as usual, very supportive of anything I chose to do. They were amazed. Uh -huh. And you know, from that moment forward, they were kind of behind me a hundred percent. And so that was really the only shows I ever did that I can recall. Okay. And then, as I say, I, I went into the research and then the hypnotherapy. And to promote mm -hmm. the hypnotherapy practice, I did a lot of public speaking. I would go out and speak to uh, Lions Clubs and Women's Clubs and condo clubs and stuff like that, telling them about right. hypnotherapy. Uh, the shows really didn't, the quote unquote shows didn't start until some, somewhat later. You know, I don't know. Okay. Huh. Okay. Yeah. So, so it sounds as though all right, you were doing hypnotherapy. So one of the things that, that I've noticed is that for those people who are already doing hypnotherapy, uh, certain aspects of stage are a little bit easier um, because when you're very, very confident in your ability to hypnotize people, then you can concentrate on the other aspects of the show. Uh, so obviously you were a very confident hypnotist when you began doing these, uh, these corporate shows. There's no substitute for experience. Uh, I mean, a lot of times people will comment if they set, saw the presentation or if they see the videos, you just look so comfortable. It's so smooth. It's so, you make it look so easy. A lot of that is really just that I had done it for so long. I mean, I had made so many mistakes mm -hmm. and done so many things wrong that you eventually figure out how to do it right. There's, there's no substitute for experience. But uh, mm -hmm. having come from an experimental psychology background, my impulse is to always think numerically think statistically and i just mm -hmm. one day you know deduced correctly that one out of ten are going to be a good subject if i have an audience of 100 people there's 10 good subjects there i really for demonstration purposes don't need to worry about the other 90 just find mm -hmm. the 10. and within that sample space 10 i found was kind of a pain in the neck to manage up on stage all you really need is five or six of those 10. so you're golden mm -hmm. you know so we got to the where as I got more popular, some of the presentations I did were, were very large. A couple were like 5,000, which is, which is enormous, actually. I mean, you can't see yeah. the back of the room. And I'd be in the yeah. green room and you'd see someone, aren't you nervous? There's five, heck no, with 5,000 people, no. I could, I, I, joke, <laughs> I could walk out, hold up a card that says sleep and ha you know, 10% would drop <laughs> off. <laughs> just to, the, the larger- Just drag would, up the limp bodies, yeah. I would get a little tensed out if they said, there's 10 people out there, you know, or uh -huh. you know, your audience tonight is 12, 50 year old, half loaded, you know, <laughs> CEOs. That would be something that I would, that would cause me pause. But uh, I've done that show. <laughs> yeah, me too. Actually, on a number of occasions. But the, uh, the larger the numbers, it, I just always looked at it as a numbers game. So it wasn't, it yep. wasn't a matter of uh, good subjects or bad subjects or whatever. It really just came down to statistics. Yeah, I, I I love a big crowd, and I, I'm I'm with you. It's uh so many more somnambulists than a big crowd, but 
Now, when you're doing your corporate, yeah, <laughs> when, you, when you're doing your corporate presentations, how many people do you like to have on stage? Uh, usually, it would be seven or eight. Um, seven yeah, or eight. the corporate presentations are a little bit different than entertainment or whatever. I was, it was usually very rigidly timed. Uh, sometimes they mm. gave me carte blanche. You know, we love it. Take as long as you need. You know, if you want to take two hours, take. Two hours. But more often than not, it's part of the convention. You're the third or the fourth or the first or the last speaker, and you have a time mm -hmm. that you are slotted to do. And uh, one, of, one of the kind of rules of corporate speaking is you don't go beyond your time without permission. Uh, you, know, right. you, you clarify it up front. Uh, if, if it goes beyond 90 minutes or, you know, and they'll say, no, no, we try to, you know, we want them out here by four o'clock, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, having the more people you have, the more things you have to do, so to speak, and the more management you have to do. Uh, and you saw the way I do it, you know, I'll pick the good subjects and I'll go up one at a time and do these kind mm -hmm. of rapid induction. So if you have 10, it added 20% to the time as opposed to eight. So it was a lot of the reason it ended up with seven or eight on stage was simply a matter of time management. If they, okay. you know, if they gave me all the time in the world and I, there were 25 somnambulists, I'd be happy to bring 25 up. I mean, you know, the more the merrier. <laughs> but it was really just a matter, you know, corporate uh, is a little bit, it, it's business. It's yeah, business, so. I, th I think that's an excellent point you make uh, that when they allot you a certain amount of time, take that amount of time and no more. And and that also goes for hypnotists that are giving talks to the, the Garden Club and the uh, the Kiwanis and that sort of thing. If they say 22 minutes, they finish it 22 minutes because these they don't like that <laughs> they, when you run over. No, they don't. Do and, and they'll report it back to the speaker bureau. They'll say, you know, great, mm -hmm. I love the guy, but, you know, he blew our schedule. And, and they just and – and, and on the other side, there are some groups that couldn't care less, absolutely couldn't care yeah. less. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a thing I posted not too long ago, uh, a presentation I did in London at, at the Barbican Center. And it was quite a production. It was a couple of thousand people. And they couldn't have told me more times. You have whatever it was. I think it was 50 minutes. 51 minutes, mm -hmm. we're going to turn the mic off. You know, you're right, right. <laughs> literally. And they had a big box. You know, you have those speakers facing you. Right in the center, there's yeah. a big box yeah. with a green light and a red light. And when you see the light go red, you got five minutes before we shut up. I mean, they, were, they weren't mean about it, but they were absolutely, yeah. we have a schedule, we have a schedule, we have a schedule. So I, I rehearsed that one. I, I, I knew right. how long 50 minutes was. So I did my thing and I was finished, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done. It's 50 minutes and the light's still green. So, hey, maybe, maybe I, you know, did it faster than I thought I did. So I did another bit and I looked down, it's still green. I did another thing, it's still green. I wrapped it up and right. I go back and this, this was, a, it's actually on YouTube. They brought me out a second time for a standing ovation, which was, you know, really kind of nice. cool. <laughs> and, and so but it's like, well, how long was I? I say, oh, we don't know. We were, we were liking it so much we stopped looking. You could have gone. <laughs> and, oh. and it was, but it was they couldn't have told me more. You know, like they must have told me a dozen times. You go beyond that right. time. We're going to shut you off. And I kept looking for the light to change. And then, yeah, finally, I wrapped it up. <laughs> oh, that was so great. You could have done another ten things. They would, you know, it's just like so. That's oh, that's it, funny. Corporate that's... strange. It, it just you know, yeah, you have to do what they want. You can't really. Well, if you have. I'm sorry. Oh, absolutely. Now that that's the customer. Yeah. So sorry about that. So if you have carte blanche, um, how long would you like to do your show? Ninety minutes? Is that uh... two hours? Was my ideal show because really? Yeah, because okay. it's not just the hypnosis. It's the the way I organized it was really mm -hmm. very clearly a fifty fifty split. I had something to say. I mean, aside mm -hmm. from the fun part and the hypnosis and demonstration, I mean, I I, I you know clearly believed that you could change your behavior by, you know, modifying the, the visualization. And I really wanted people to understand and stop and think about thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. We have certain assumptions we make about our own consciousness and how much control we have over our thinking and what's going on inside our head. And, and I just had what I thought were some insightful ways of looking at it. So if I had carte blanche, I would spend mm -hmm. a full hour talking about for lack of the, the content, the more serious stuff. And then the second half would have been uh, the demonstration. Um, and, and 90 minutes was the more, most common uh, format, but then many, many of them were an hour. And the shortest I think I ever did, it was 45 minutes. Shorter than that was 45. real difficult for me. Yeah, I wonder about that. What uh, 45 minutes is, is short, particularly 
in in your in your program because you you're not just doing a hypnosis show you're also doing a motivational speech or an informative speech so who beyond you know any shorter than 45 minutes i imagine that would be pretty difficult would would you turn down a job if they gave you 30 Hell minutes no <laughs> 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 i'd figure it out <laughs> like, are you crazy <laughs> no. yeah sometimes i am <laughs> <laughs> but no i didn't turn down bookings and if they said you got to do it all in 15 minutes uh, i figured it out somehow <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the state of the industry. Yes. The floor level, the entry level for mm -hmm. corporate speakers is 5,000 plus expenses. And the reason that's the entry level is mm -hmm. uh, if you're ever going to get booked by a speaker bureau, they collect either a 20 or a 25% commission. And if they have a choice between two speakers, one that says is a hypnotist for 10,000 and the other is a hypnotist for 2,500, you can bet they're going to be booking a ten thousand dollars speech, whether that person's better or not. Sometimes, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. they they will. But if they're if they're, you've got two adequate speakers, strangely enough, and because the, they're collecting a commission, and why would they want to get a commission on twenty five hundred when they can get a commission on you know? So kind of the entry level before they'll even pay attention to you, before it's worth their effort to book you, you start out at five thousand, and then if you're any good, you rapidly move up and. And I keep using mm -hmm. ten thousand as the marker, just just for the record. The marker, the mark's moved. It's it's fifteen now. You know, if you're decent, it's twelve five to fifteen is is the new, you know, the new present. So uh, that's why you want to get to that level. That's why you want to really start at that level. Well, why? I mean, all right. So that's that's one very good reason that a hypnotist would want to make the switch to doing corporate speaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's. Obviously, they're they're going to be making a heck of a lot more money. But what what are the other advantages to a hypnotist to get into the corporate gang? Uh, you know, it depends on whether you're looking at it from a monetary point of view or a personal satisfaction point of view. For me, in terms of the personal satisfaction, when I was doing the hypnotherapy, I loved it. You know, I it really mm -hmm. it, it, I I always looked at it as artistry because every client you had. It, it, if you were good, you had to approach them differently. You had to mold your technique for their needs. You couldn't do, it wasn't cookie cutter. Everybody was new and different. You know, so I looked at it as mm -hmm. keys into a lock and I loved it. Um, but it was like one person at a time. And then when I did the corporate speaking, as I say, sometimes it was 5,000 at a time, you know, more often than not, it was mm -hmm. three or 400 at a time, but you just the impact you were having on people's lives, the number of people you could impact was so much larger. So from from that kind of pure professional point of view, just the ability to reach so many more people was appealing mm -hmm. to me. And um, my, my wife often jokes about it. I, and I'm, I'm sure the same thing happens to you. I regularly get emails, uh, not every day, but you know, relatively often. I attended mm -hmm. your program 10 years. It changed my life. You know, I heard you do this. This really made a difference or, you know, mm -hmm. really was important to me. And my wife will get these, you know, she's kind of funny. She goes, you're still a jerk, you know, she goes, but she'll read, a, she'll read the email and she'll say, you know, some people wouldn't get an email like this in their lifetime. They would be thrilled yeah. to get something like, you know, you changed my life so, you know, once in their yeah. life. And you get them like weekly or monthly. And she goes, uh, and that is uh, another, to know that you're having that kind of impact, that mm -hmm. number of people it w was appealing from that truly, from that purely professional point of view. And then the other side of it is the, uh, clearly the monetary part, uh, tra you know, all mm -hmm. of a sudden you're traveling first class, you're playing with the big boys. The audiences tend to be the high producers. You know, when they send me to Cabo, so when they sent me to, you know, the, the Palm Springs and stuff, they're not sending their losers to Palm Springs. They're, they're sending the, the award winners, the high mm -hmm. producers. Uh, I d did an interview not too long ago and it reminded me of something. Uh, I, I would routinely take my product and put it on an eight foot table, you know, the CDs and, the, mm -hmm. and then when it was time for me to speak, I would leave and tip, typically the table was outside the room. And then right. I wouldn't do my presentation at the end I'd come out and whoever wanted to purchase could purchase. And Often people will come up and say, are you just going to leave those CDs sitting on the table like that? Well, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> do you want me to get a cover, cover them? No, you don't have to do that. I was like, well, why are you leaving them there? <laughs> and I, I, yeah, it was simple. Number one, the type of people that I was speaking to don't steal. I mean, you know, you're they, love, they don't have to be ripping off CDs. And, and, my, right. and, and my second thing was 
anybody you know who's desperate enough to swipe a CD, a motivational CD, <laughs> probably needs it. You know, I mean, what am I? I, I hope it helps. <laughs> and and the, the the paradox was, I think maybe twice I'd come out and a set would be missing, but it was just uh -huh. so. Uh, the point was that's the kind of people you're dealing with. That's the um, not that there's anything at state fairs or anything, but it's it's a different mentality. It's a, you know you're dealing with a corporate audience, um, which I think you know from a purely monetary point of view, material point of view, is very mm -hmm. rewarding. I, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. You know, and yeah, you know it's it's this seems to be a parallel also with hypnotherapy because I know that hypnotists uh, hypnotherapists that charge seventy five dollars a session get a different clientele than hypnotherapists that charge $250 a session. Isn't that weird? And yeah, and, and often their their results are better because there's more, uh, the client places more value in the therapy. Like I said, so I, I could see that. early on, we're going with that other guy because he charges $300 and you're charging 50. You know, he's gotta be six times right. better than you. He must be, yeah, must be better. And, and, and often he will be better just because that's a perception of the client. I mean, the client was going to value that, uh, that person's, uh, help more. Right. Um, and, and, and also they're, they're invested. Uh, your corporate clients are invested if they're paying you $15,000 for your, for your talk. How about, I know some, um, some speakers, corporate speakers also get into training uh add on things did you ever have you ever done anything like that or i i didn't when i was doing the public speaking um a very uh -huh. good friend of mine in fact a guy who was a roommate for two years in college who uh is a motivational speaker um his name is bob davies he's excellent does a presentation on peak performance uh he comes from a, an, mm -hmm. an athletic background and he for years was saying that uh he would do his presentation and at the end of his talk he would say that I take a select group of people for personal coaching, personal professional mm -hmm. coaching. And if you have an interest, come and see me, you know, on the side. So he didn't make a big deal about it in his motivational presentation, but he put it out there that if you want personal one-to-one -one coaching and there would, you know, be a percentage of people that would come and he, it was, he charged a relatively high premium. I know, I, I, I think I have the numbers right, that if you signed up with him, I think it was either six or $8,000 initial investment you had uh -huh. guarantee for the first three months that you wouldn't drop out you know it was like and and then it was i believe a thousand dollars a month afterwards and he would speak to you once every two weeks and he had a website set up where they would mm -hmm. they would set their goals and they'd be able to monitor their goals and they had to fill in what they had accomplished and there was accountability and i i do recall you know during the 2008 crash when pretty much the economy of the country mm -hmm. really slowed uh we were having a conversation you know how are you doing I, i'm doing okay. So, well, if it, if it was not for my coaching, I'd be in trouble because the mm. niche he had was, was, uh, severely hit by the uh, recession. So, uh, that's a personal friend that I know did that mm -hmm. and other people would do that. They would do, uh, they would target companies and industries and they would offer personalized sales training and there's, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of different directions you can go in. You know, I mean, the, okay. there really is a lot you can do. Um, yeah. And, and also like, I mean, his, his model, he had a second stream of income. Exactly. Which is Diverse, diversifying your income. Say that's <laughs> well, that's, that's and, something and the, that a lot of people that came to the master class that they, they, by the way, were an unbelievably great group of people. I could not have asked for a better group for a first class. They, they were wonderful, but a couple of them I've spoken to, what product do you have to sell? Well, I don't have any product. You should have probably, I mean, if, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy or whatever, but you should be offering something at the end of your presentation and it will ultimately be an additional 20% in income on the average. Mm. You know, sometimes you sell a ton of it, sometimes you, but it averages out to about 20% of your income. Uh, you should put together a set of CDs or a DVD or write a book. And if you, if you don't know how to write a book, get someone to write one for you, but you should have, you know, well, no, no, there's nothing wrong with hiring a professional ghostwriter, but you should have something to offer at the end because if you do your job well, they're going to want to take a piece of you home with them. And, and it, you know, there are days when it just all comes together where it's just amazing. You know, even you're amazed. Holy smoke. That was unbelievable. And if you have product to sell, they'll buy anything here. Take the, take my Jaguar, buy my Jaguar. You know, they'll buy anything. 
And <laughs> I'm not sure they ever listened to any of it. Um, I at one this is this is the God's honest truth. At one point, this was back when I was selling tapes instead of CDs. I guess it would be the late '90s. Uh -huh. I really was. I, I had I had this package of twelve tapes that I would sell, and I don't think anybody ever listened to it. I was going to take tape eleven and twelve and just put blank tapes in there and see how long it would take before someone called and complained. <laughs> I, I could, they're never going to get down to number 12. You know, there's maybe 1% that's actually going to listen to this stuff. Um, you know, it's a, it's a shame to say, but yeah, that's true. Uh, so many people buy products and they don't use them. True. Very true. And, and I'm not saying put out a bad product or something. They put out the highest quality right. product you can, but if you do uh -huh. well, if you have a good day and, and you will have lots of good days, you know, the more you practice, mm -hmm. there's a percentage of people that are going to want to, to, uh, continue that experience and they will buy a product mm -hmm. and um there's really no reason in the world it's in this day and age where it's so easy to produce cds and to have books written and when i when i wrote mm -hmm. my book <clears throat> i had to buy thirteen thousand five hundred of them to get it a, you know the price down to where it was i, I guess yep. being four or five hours a book whatever it was. And I remember they, they came in with a 40 footer and they loaded them into my garage on pallets and I would take them, you know, box of mm -hmm. 50 or hundred at a time to sell them. And today mm -hmm. with digital printing, you can call and say, I need 20 books. You know, it's, yes. it's, uh, it's a, it's a different world. So there's really no reason not to have product to sell. And I'm not saying hammer product mm -hmm. sales. I'm just saying, if you, if you liked it, happen to be an author of a book mm -hmm. or you want, you know, some tapes or CDs, happen to have these CDs mm -hmm. in the back. Doesn't have to be a hard sell. It's sure. And I, I could imagine that some of your corporate gigs, though, uh, you wouldn't be allowed to. I mean, some of the corporate exactly gigs, right. they don't want you to. You're exactly. Right. No. You always clear that with the client in advance. You know? uh -huh. uh, when you uh, typically when you get the bid and you know, they're considering you, would you be available? Yes. Okay, uh -huh. They decide they want to use you. And you typically set up a conference call with them, a needs analysis, and you bring that up then. You know, do you have, it's, it's entirely your call. I do have products, no problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I typically sell them at the back of the room or outside. If you uh, mm -hmm. provide an eight foot table, if they say we don't allow product sales, you know, no problem. No. Right. Uh, but most, most will allow you if someone hasn't come in and killed it for you. Uh, right. I was a few years back doing a thing for Sprint in Kansas City, mm -hmm. based out of Kansas City. And it was a big talk. It was a few thousand people at the at the corporate headquarters and in the contract. You know, I, I'd spoken to the people. I can I sell my product? Yes. I brought mm -hmm. my display, you know, I put it up. And I was due to go on right after lunch. So I set it up while everybody was having lunch. And my liaison came up to me and said, um, Anthony, I know that you asked to do this and I know it says it in the contract. And you know, but would mm -hmm. you mind not selling product? No, oh, you know, and she, I'll tell you why. Uh, we, we had this speaker today and he just sold the heck out of this book. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a piece of it now, right. but if you really want to understand it, you got to buy my course because, you know, CD and, uh, and he went on and on and on about it. And then at the end, he went through this, you know, like 15 minute long sales pitch. And when it came time to where he said, okay, now how many of you are going to buy my product? The vice president literally got up on stage and said, none of you are buying anything from this guy. <laughs> he, he was furious. He said, you know, we paid this guy, whatever they paid him. You know? Yeah. And right. it was just, and, and she said, it's nothing you've done. You know, so one person who overdoes it can kill a company for five years. You know, I, I doubt oh, yeah. ever going to let anybody sell product at their presentation. Right. And I'm sure that wasn't very good for his career. Some, going forward. Some people look at it. I don't know why they, some people look at it different than I do. It's, but yeah, you know, for some, well, see it well, I mean, clearly as a positive thing. Uh, I don't you know. So. No, no, no. I mean, I think you're, you're there to, um, to please your customer and, um, it's nice to get back of the room sales, but it's even nicer to get customers that rave about you and, and tell people, Hey, Jim, how are you doing? Uh, and tell people that you're a good speaker and you're not one of these pushy people that that's out there trying to sell his book and his tapes and everything like that. So it's, it's nice. You know, another thing that just occurs to me is that uh, that call that you know, conference call that you do with the prospective customer is probably a very important yes. call. That's <laughs> all the needs analysis. So, uh, right. very important. needs analysis. Right. Yeah. So I imagine somebody who can master that, um, it's going to be far more, far more successful than a, uh, 
a corporate speaker that doesn't know how to handle himself or herself in that kind of a situation. Uh, so I I'm think, sure. I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, extremely important that you do that. Um, here, and here's the difference. Uh, through the years, obviously, when I go to all these conferences, I often will see the speaker before me or the speaker after me, or uh, I've heard a lot of speakers. And, and uh -huh. some have a, a canned delivery. You know, I, I could see mm -hmm. them in front of one group and then a different company and a different company. And it's the same speech. And right. one thing that I did to differentiate mine early on, and it's such an easy thing to do, is you have these calls beforehand and you try to learn a little bit about the company, a little bit about what they're trying to accomplish, what the theme of the conference is, what new products are, what's going on, any uh, events that are happening within the company. And usually mm -hmm. it, with 10 minutes or less of effort, you can include that and reference that throughout your presentation. And people, mm -hmm. uh, it just has such an amazingly more powerful impact. It's just, uh, you, you, could sound, you sound like you're talking to me as a, to what we're doing as opposed to, and I don't know why all speakers don't do it. They don't. Yeah, but the ones that I, do, I saw. It, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I just saw Denise giving you uh, clicking props here because uh, uh, another uh, another corporate or uh, another stage hypnotist and hypnotherapist, uh, uh, Denise Hall, because that's one of her big things too is getting together with the client and and and. Um, finding getting some intelligence on what's going on in the company so that you can you can give them a special uh you can how do i want to put this i'm having personalize. a little trouble here so they, and yeah you can personalize your right your customize your presentation to them exactly and then another thing that i think is always a good idea is to get with them when you arrive and make sure mm -hmm. that there's nothing that you don't know that you should know that could get you in trouble during your presentation because you don't know what's just happened to the company. Right. Uh, they've just appeared in the New York Times or worse than that, a tabloid. Uh, what's going on? Something you know, something terrible just happened to the CEO. I mean, you need to know these things before you get on stage. And take it one step beyond. You're absolutely correct. It could not be more on the mark. You do your pre-talk with the powers that be, the people that are hiring you, the decision makers. And when you get there, you reaffirm it. You know, this is what the topics I'm going to cover. And then you do one more thing to make it perfect. You get there at least, whatever you're talking, at least an hour, 45 minutes before you have to speak. And if they have a coffee break, you go out and talk to the actual people in the conference. What's going on? What's important to you? What do you think is happening? Because sometimes mm -hmm. what the powers that be think is happening is not necessarily in line with the ground level people. <laughs> and there's no reason uh -huh. why you can't do both. There's no reason why you cannot address the issues that the powers, you always want to please the client. There's no reason why you cannot mm -hmm. custom design your presentation to please the client. And if you take just a few more minutes and talk to some of the people on the ground, also include things that people on the ground think are important. So everybody's happy. And it's, it's real idea. simple, it, you know, but a lot of people don't do it. 360. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I don't know, I guess pet beefs or whatever. I, I saw a presentation once where a stage hypnotist, actually more than once, gives the subject suggestions, whatever the suge suggestion happens to be. Mm -hmm. And the subject perform it beautifully, whatever the suggestion mm -hmm. happens to be. And the hypnotist stands forward and takes a bow. And they're clapping. In. And I'm oh. sitting there thinking to myself, wait a minute, you didn't do anything. <laughs> they're right. the ones that did that incredible thing. And so- exactly. It, it, very early on in my career, I just realized that it's really all about them, not about me. And if, if right. anything, I will do the best to diminish my influence. I'll say, you know, that person is doing an amazing thing. They're actually exhibiting a really a outstanding degree of concentration or whatever. And a, a lot of my stuff was filmed. And I, I learned that I had to go to the video people before the event started and say, because, because the way I did it was, if the subject did something amazing, I was always trying to explain it to the rest of the group. Not being able mm -hmm. to find your shoe in your hand is actually right. an example of what's called a negative hallucination. Happens all the time, you know. Whatever. And I'd stand outside and explain what that person over there was doing. And mm -hmm. the first few times I did that, I'd look at the video, and what the what the video guy had done was zoomed in on me. Now here's the subject uh, doing an absolutely incredible thing, and it's mm -hmm. like. And no, no, it's not about me. You know, if you see that happen and you make sure you zoom in on them, that's what's amazing. Mm -hmm. not, not me standing there yeah. talking about it. You know, so I agree um, with you 100%. Yeah. You know, I just uh, 
early on, I just think that there are some, some, not certainly not even the majority, but there are some of the stage hypnotists that think it's all about them. And it's, it, mm -hmm. I just think they'd be better served by focusing on the client or on the person as opposed to themselves. Absolutely. It's, we're, we're not the, uh, we're not the star, the people in the chairs, the committee, they're the stars of the show. And I, I think probably most of us would agree with that, but there, you're right. There are some that, that would not, Hey, I wanted to bring up something. Now you have, you have a couple of classes coming up. Do. You have, you have one in, uh, in Florida and one in Frankfurt, Germany. Yes. And, and I'll post the links to these classes. Uh, but the people that come to this class to learn how to do what you do, they're expected to already be hypnotists, right? They're, they're expected to already, you're not teaching them how to hypnotize. Uh, in the first class we did, nobody hypnotized anybody, <laughs> which just seems strange to have a room full of hypnotists where no hypnosis uh -huh. takes place. Uh, the, the idea is that you have a core competency in hypnosis. If you're a stage mm -hmm. hypnotist, if you're a psychologist that uses hypnosis, a hypnotherapist, a holistic healer that uses hypnosis, uh, I, there were chiropractors, there were people involved in all kinds of aspects of, of healing and health. And you want to take that sk your skills as a hypnotist and learn how to market them to the corporate market, how to put it together mm -hmm. as a corporate keynote. That, which is what I did. My topic was goal setting. That certainly doesn't have to be your topic, but you know, I use goal setting as a vehicle right. to get my message across. That's what the master class is about. So it, it, right. it's not a hypnosis one-on-one course. And uh, the group we had come were all extremely accomplished, very experienced. Uh, many of them, you, you would know their names. You know, Catherine Hicklin was there, uh, Dylan Counts, uh, Incredible Boris was there. Incredible, he's, he's been there for any of us. You know, Incredible Boris has been around yeah. as long as I have. And just, you know, that was the caliber of people that came, the truly. Yeah, I, I know a lot of them. I know a lot of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful group! And everybody clicked, and it was just everybody helping each other. It was it was a truly magical event. I mean, I, I yeah. still can't get over it. And yeah, there there are two of them. Uh, we're having, as you say, the first one is going to be in uh, July in Frankfurt on the weekend, the sixteenth and seventeenth. And the second program will be in Orlando the sixth and the seventh. Again, Saturday and Sunday, sixth uh, and seventh of August in Orlando. And uh, if you post the link, that would be wonderful. And the, uh, there's an early bird discount that goes away in, I guess, about seven or eight days at the end of the month on the 30th. It's a $500 off discount. Uh, but I was advised to do something here on a live blog. And I think I discussed it with you. Is okay if I do this? Mm -hmm. Sure, of course. Uh, if anyone, uh, I've, I've activated a coupon on the site. If you uh, make a decision to come, to, if you go to the website, uh, follow the link. And if you are interested in taking the course, if you sign up before the 30th of the April, you get $500 off. If you want an additional $200 discount uh, for the next 24 hours, I've activated a coupon. If you use Stripe to sign up, you can either do it with PayPal mm -hmm. or Stripe. If you go Stripe to sign up, you'll see a promotional box where you can enter a coupon. If you just put the number 200 in there, it will take $200 off the price. And I'll keep that active for 24 hours for people that were motivated enough to be part of this live chat. Okay, great. Um, what we do is I've just posted the... Um I just posted the two links, Thank you. the one to the frock for course, no problem. And the one to the, um, the Orlando class. Could you say just a few words about, about how the course is run the two days, how that, uh, is laid out? Uh, broke clearly broken into two distinct parts. You know, day number one is all about putting the corporate presentation together. And we talk about, you know, mm -hmm. first you have to identify what your brand is and then showing you how to do the needs analysis that we were talking about how to construct mm -hmm. your talk so that it adds value to the convention or conference that you're speaking to, exactly the formula for doing the talk, how to segue into a hypnosis demonstration, and then how to take everything you're doing in the demonstration and relate it back to the original talk. The idea is in the corporate world is that people come out of your presentation with something hands-on. Uh, at mm -hmm. the corporate level, they don't want entertainment as much as they want value. What are my people going to get from having come to your talk? what skill, what knowledge, what technique that's going to make them more productive, better salespeople, more motivated, more relaxed, whatever it happens to be, what's the value? And so we show you how to, how to first identify the brand, you know, do the needs analysis. First day is all about constructing and developing the actual talk. Day number two is, okay. all right, you got your talk. How do you market it? What markets do you go after? I call it the spider web approach. How do you take an industry such as real estate, insurance, financial services, IT? How do you target an industry 
get through the front mm. door and then use that as a, as a platform. And then another part of it is how do you get yourself booked by bureaus? And we actually have coming to both of the talks, a for, former bureau rep, this guy booked me like a hundred times. He worked for a rep out of uh, Colorado. He actually knows all about what the bureau is looking for. And he's got an excellent presentation about as a bureau rep, this is what I'm looking for in your demo tape. This is what I want to see uh -huh. on your website. These are the words I want to hear you say. This is what I want to hear the client say afterwards. I mean, he shows you exactly how th this is the kiss of death. I don't want to hear about prima donnas that, you know, you went and screamed and yelled and you know, <laughs> oh, had yeah. a T-bone steak for room service and a bottle of champagne. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they do, you know, my expenses are paid. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just you'd be amazed at what some people do. Yeah. You know? Oh my but, god. But I mean, some of the stuff that sounds like it'd be common sense, but a lot of times people go, yeah, I, I, sh I never thought of that, you know. And he's just actually. <laughs> so the all day two is you got your talk. Now here's all the different aspects of marketing it, uh, how to do the product sale in a, in you know, let's say in three minutes or less. It's it's not a big hammer them over the head, but here here are the elements you want to do. Just the whole aspects right. of marketing. So day number one is putting the talk together. Day number two is how to market it. And then we build into the course two coaching calls because I know that most people are not going to walk out the door and not run into some roadblock or problem or something they didn't mm -hmm. get at the program. So as part of the price, anytime in the next six months, they're entitled to two coaching calls at their convenience. You know? And and it's, it's really, that really made a difference because there are a number of people that, you know, went right at, started using it, and they ran into a situation mm -hmm. they didn't quite understand. We'd set up a conference call or a coaching call on the phone with them for an hour, problem solved. Mm -hmm. you, you'd probably be hard pressed to find some aspect of the business that I haven't screwed up at some point. <laughs> 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 but to put it, I look at, honest to God, this is the way I look at this course. It took me like five or six years of making mistakes before I got to where I was making a decent living in this business. Uh, my goal yeah. in these courses is to cut that five years out for you. I, it, whatever yeah. mistake could have been made, I made it. So I can show, I can, <laughs> you know, I can show you how to avoid the minefields and get right to, you know, once you figure it out, it's not rocket science, it's not difficult. It's a system. Uh -huh. So that's the course. Yeah. And we okay, got these excellent. testimonials. If you go to the website, go to the testimonials page. The people that actually went in January that are actually out there scheduling corporate talks, really doing it, really, you know, changing their lives. Uh, we, we now have a track record. When I, when I first put these courses together, I believed that in a weekend we could teach people how to do this. Now I know we can, you know, now we've got the track record. So. Excellent. Yeah. I just, I just posted that, uh, okay. that link to the uh, testimonials there At, and video testimonials are so good. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's it, it's so different from a written testimonial where you could have a ellipsis, you know, and what was what was in there, um, and you know, damning with faint praise and that sort of thing. It's it's hard to, I mean, when you got a video testimonial, it's it's easy to tell what the student really thought. And and I have looked at some of those testimonials, and they're pretty good. So um, uh, yeah, I'm not out. sure I should share this. It's, it's, but what did you pay it's, them? What did you? <laughs> no, let me tell you what happened. That was such a magical group. They were, they, uh -huh. I am so proud of them. I feel like they're, they're, you know, my children are going out and they're really actually doing it. Um, the day after the course, first of all, uh -huh. at the, at the end of the first day, you know, I was kind of tired. I'd done, uh, and I went upstairs, went to bed. They stayed up till like three in the morning. They all huddled into groups of five or six and they were going over, they were into it. Cool, and cool. they've all stayed in touch. And the day after the course, uh, one of them opened up a private uh, Facebook group. You know, my group is called oh. Corporate Hypnosis. He opened up a group called mm -hmm. Corporate Hypnosis Masterclass. And he sent, yeah. he sent invitations to all the people that had attended the course. And they all mm -hmm. signed up. Now they got their own private Facebook page and they smirk at my other page. Oh, those guys, they don't know anything. <laughs> you know, and, and they, it's, it's one of the most interesting pages because they're all trying to help each other every day. They come up with something new I and mean, they're just, it's a really powerful, uh, and they're all helping each other 
get to ah, where they want to so go. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable group of people. And, you know, setting up a second seminar, this is actually the second time we've done it. We're just looking forward to doing it again, you know, to get a group together. We're, mm -hmm. and we're talking about putting their private group together and seeing how they compare to what the first group does. Because when they've mm -hmm. gone through the training and they understand what the concepts are, they're all out there helping each other. It's that's why you don't see them on my old corporate page. And, you know, they, they all they all abandon that. You know, we're there. and they're just they're too good for that. <laughs> kind of like that, but they really have done amazing things. They, I'm, I'm truly impressed with their their accomplishments. So, very proud of them. Oh, that's good. That's good. All right. Well, we're we're coming up on uh, on our hour. So, uh, any uh, any last uh, any final thoughts you'd like to share before we. Uh, End the recording? Uh, you know, it's uh, the European class is my first time in Europe. And one uh, comment I've heard from a couple of folks is we don't really have a lot of speaker bureaus over here and it's not structured the same way it is in the United States. And, and I'm fully aware of that. So the class in Europe is going to be structured and, and the emphasis is going to be a little bit different than what the emphasis is over in the Orlando class. But mm -hmm. in Europe, you have banks, real estate firms, investment firms, IT firms, just like any country or a mm -hmm. city does and that's the corporate market and they all have meetings they all bring their people together sometimes two or three times a year there's really no difference um a gentleman that that uh, i had coached now down in brazil rafael beltresca again no speaker bureaus i think they have one speaker bureau down there and mm -hmm. so no speaker bureaus to speak of he you know sh i showed him how he's penetrated the corporate market and he's saying you know this is duplicatable any con any uh modern com country is going to have all the infrastructure mm -hmm. you need to do this mm -hmm. this kind of activity so don't don't freak out thinking well we're going to speak of yours here therefore it wouldn't work for me it absolutely would yeah it could be a wide open market could it be is a wide open market. very fertile ground yeah. yeah interesting interesting and as someone had a quick question sure. uh, i think it was uh eugene was asking about yeah about people from europe getting gigs in the u.s um there are absolutely no restrictions that I'm aware of for anybody from any country coming in here to give a speech for any group. And mm -hmm. uh, for example, one of the attendees mm -hmm. in our program was uh, Mustafa Badaway. And Mustafa's from Colombia. He's actually uh -huh. the star of that program. Um, why can't I get the name straight? Uh, in the back room. Well, but you're back in the room. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, back in the room. Okay. okay. I, I, yes. And, and he's doing the Colombian version. He's actually filmed 15 episodes. And oh, cool. he was in Orlando two weeks ago. We got together for lunch. And he says, yes, mm -hmm. uh, Colombian telecommunications company is having their convention here at uh, Orlando. Oh. And they wanted me to come and give the speech. So, you know, I'm Colombian. They brought me no restrictions whatsoever. You, and, what? Uh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. You, you take a, a German company like Siemens, right? right? Exactly. They're very big in the U.S. Bring a cool. And very then cool the idea. other the other side of the coin is, as an American, I spoke <clears throat> numerous times in Canada, South America, Rome, uh, Paris, uh, Monte Carlo, London on a number of occasions, uh, Cairo twice, Singapore, Philippines. Absolutely no restrictions. So you will have that's uh, once you gain notoriety and once you gain a level of uh, proficiency, it's that's one that was one of the fun parts of the job. So you got sent all over the place, and that's great. And also you have got a big corporate name. And if any legwork needs to be done, if any you know boxes need to get checked with the government, they can do that for the speaker. So that's I like that. That's that's really cool. So I'm glad you asked that question two there. Two weeks ago, Madam, went over to Orlando, over to uh, Universal City Walk and had. Yeah, I'm over here because the Colombian company brought me up to speak to their group. So no problems at all. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Very cool. Huh. All right. Well, uh, any any other final thoughts before we uh, we stop the recording? Ah, I hope you all come to the program. I promise a, a life changing event. I'm looking forward to meeting you when I come over there. I understand that Frank yes. is, is very close to your. Um, Digs and we'll find a chance away. to meet in person. I'm looking yes. forward to Sounds it. I'll good. do a great job for you guys. And hey, Sean, thanks so much, man. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. It's great talking talk. with you. Thank you all for tuning in here. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.